Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever and whenever you're watching this show. Cross's Corner. I'm Martin Cross, and with me is the amazing Janine Gamelan. Hi, Janine. Hi, Martin. Nat, thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you with us. Uh, I'm I'm so interested to to talk to you about your rowing career and um and lo- lots of other things too. Um, just give us a flavour of what you've been doing today, how your days are now, and and what what's happened today. Um, I'm actually pretty busy. I have loads of stuff to do, and my agenda is pretty full. But today has been kind of an easier day. I've met up with a friend for lunch and uh, did a little training session in the morning. And then this afternoon, I joined actually Nick Cloyd, the assistant coach of Swiss Rowing Federation, uh, for a session on the water. Yeah. All uh, right. <laughs> so you're still keeping fit by the sounds of things. Um, I don't know if you can call it fit, but I try to do some exercise, obviously, with the whole situation. My energy level is pretty low and also things like sleep and um, fueling properly is not the easiest at the moment with the process I'm going through. Uh, So I just kind of try and make the best of what I can. Um, But I do try to do a little bit of exercise every day. Yeah, yeah, I I can understand that. Um, And I know because we were talking about it, I know that you've very recently come back uh, from spending 10 days in the UK. Yeah, that's correct. I've been over to visit friends and family of Robin and also now friends of me a bit. And <laughs> um, again, like I've invited myself on the launch with a, a few coaches um, to kind of just, yeah. The main goal was to see rowing from Robin's perspective a little bit. Um, so that's why... Yeah, I've been still around um, rowing boats and water. Yeah, um, that, that's really interesting. And I gather that you even went on the water in a night. Yeah, I got invited to join um, a Sunday session on the Henley stretch and I couldn't uh, not take up that offer and uh, did went out for a row in the night with seven guys, which was really nice. Oh, and you were in the <laughs> sixth seat. I was in the sixth seat, yeah. yeah. How did you find rowing? Um, obviously, it was quite emotional to be on the Henley stretch because it was the most favourite place of Robins. Um, so that was kind of special. But to be fair, the rowing was really good. It was really smooth and we had a nice rhythm and the boat had a nice flow to it, which um, I haven't really felt in an eight before. So, yeah. Kudos to the guys. Well, and kudos to you. And because uh, single scholars can do most things, I think uh, when they did the great eight, um, did you ever row in one of those in one of those eights that uh, were put together, the scholars eight? Yeah, I did. I did race twice in Boston at the head of the Charles in the great eight, ah. and I also raced the European great eight twice at the Basel head. Oh wow! Yeah. I hadn't remembered that where did they sit you in that eight then Janine I can actually not remember this time around in November at the Baselhead I remember being on two but all of the other ones I was kind of more towards the bow of the boat but I actually don't remember yeah which seats and I'm guessing you raced on the you've raced on the Henley course haven't you yeah I did I did race there in 2018, and uh, yeah, I was able to win the thing. <laughs> yeah, which is which is fantastic achievement. Can you remember who you beat in the final? Yeah, that was Australia's Maddie. Oh, what was her name? Um, I can't remember. She was Australian, yeah. but she, I think, she actually ended her career maybe the year after. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow! So. Um... I, I think anyone that's in connection with Ryan will, will know um, that you have announced your retirement. Uh, I can't imagine the steps that you must have been through um, to come to that decision. Um, can you tell us a little bit about why 
you decided now was the time for you to stop and and what it was like trying to come to that decision yeah sure so i've been thinking about retiring or kind of like how my journey was going to carry on around and before and after tokyo um already a little bit so it wasn't like something that seemed to be um 10 years away but after tokyo because it was a really positive experience for me i decided to keep going and the main driving factor for me was the kind of the teamwork between robin and i we had this unique um, dynamic of feeding off of each other's passion um, to be better at our craft which was kind of really yeah it's just a really nice vibe and also ex inspiring at times and I felt I still had this strong desire to strive for excellence on a daily basis and, and kind of really wanted to keep living this, this lifestyle. And um, with Robin's passing, this kind of like my, my reason why was, was more or less gone immediately. And also due to his loss, I was forced kind of to go through a really intense journey of grief and personal growth at the same time. And in order for me to be able to develop as a person, I felt like I had to take this step away from the sport. And that, that's what I did. And as often in life, it wasn't an easy decision or an easy thing to do, but I do think it was the right thing for me. Um, it, it sounds, uh, th what you're talking about, a process, sounds... Um extremely painful in places but you know it sounded like there there were um some positive aspects you were talking about your growth as a person what what's it been like for you to go through that process how have you experienced it kind of nothing like you see in the media or read in books or hear from people or just like kind of very much like a roller coaster one day i could be feeling quite okay and like feel some sense of joy and excitement for what's ahead of me and other days I would just feel really really sad and um, really have no energy at all or basically just the sadness sucking all of the energy out of me and um, just really missing like Robin and like I said the teamwork we had that was just something so special and um yeah, it's this up and down and kind of really unpredictable as well because one day I could be feeling really great and then out of the blue um, there would come this kind of wave of sadness and I didn't really know um, whether it was going to come or it wasn't going to come. But like you say, it has been really hard, but also there have been things that I was able to see as opportunities because I really think... Hard experiences make you grow the most. And I always, in my whole career and as a person, embrace challenges kind of with an open heart and open arms because they just, I know I can learn from them and become better at the other end. Well, that's, that sounds amazing. Is, is that a process that um, you have help from, from anybody? I had an amazing... Um, support system around me obviously in the first initial phase which is my family and my friends and especially my sister she kind of more or less moved in with me for the first three weeks and just made sure I eat I drink I sleep and um, has really been taking care of me in an amazing way and it's brought us a lot closer as sisters which has been something uh -huh. that I can take out of this and be really grateful for, but also um, obviously my two brothers and my mom and just friends that that, be, that have been there for me. I did work with psychologists and um, that has obviously made a difference, but at the same time, I also think um, that I just need time on my own to kind of just process what is happening. Yeah. So, yeah, it's this balance between kind of doing stuff on my own and just kind of trying to get through the day sometimes and also having some help and support. But family has been 
yeah, amazing. Oh, that's fantastic. And and I guess, are, are you in the same place? You're in Zarnan now, in your apartment in Zarnan. Um, yes, I am, yeah. Is that where you and Robin were based? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've so been based here the last 10 years, more or less, so it's really my home, and I really do feel at home here. And, uh, yeah, I just... I just felt like this is the place where I feel safest and where I feel most at home. So I haven't changed uh, my location. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if it's all right, it'd be really nice to talk a bit about Robin. I knew Robin um, from talking to him and, and meeting him, but um, uh, it would it would be lovely to to talk about Robin's uh, talent as a coach. Um, what he managed to bring out in you, uh, what he could see about the way the boat moves, um, all of those kind of things. So when when did you and Robin first um, meet and get together? In very early 2017. So he yeah. started as a head coach of Swiss rowing in um, 1st of February in 2017. So that's when I first met him and I didn't know him previously. And I mean, talking about Robin, like the list is endless. So I could name so many uh, qualities that he had. But I think sticking out to me most was his ability to meet everyone he crossed paths with um, on their very individual level, on their like yeah. um, at eyesight, whether that was a two year old kid or someone much <laughs> older than him. That I think was really one of his most outstanding skills. He was also really empathic and um, he saw an athlete as a person first and foremost. Oh, and wow. um, obviously, he had an extremely amazing work ethic. He was working so hard every day to be the best at coaching people and bringing out the best in, in the athletes he was looking after. And he kept always learning about the sport, about physiology and just mm. life in general. And um, I think when I, when I was over in the UK a few weeks back, I got to see kind of where his coaching career started, which was yeah. at William Bowles. Yeah. And obviously seeing what he did out of basically nothing um, was really, really inspiring and kind of, completed the picture of Robin for me um, because that's kind of how I knew him. Like he just showed me why he was so hardworking and, and kind of this belief of just like, if you believe in something, you can make it happen. Mm. So yeah, that was, mm. that's kind of what, what I can say about Robin. I mean, I can carry on, but these are kind of the main things for me. Yeah. Um, so when Robin started working with you in that, that February of 2017, that, that was an amazing season for you. Um, what kind of impact did his coaching have on you? Because um, uh, people watching may know, but you, you went from the Olympic A final being in fifth place to being world champion that year in, in quite a, a stack field as well. Um, so what what changed or how did your your sculling in technically and, and otherwise develop when Robin started to look after you? Um, I think, I mean, I've done kind of like a few years of full-time training when I started working with him. And I think kind of most of that started to pay off. And then obviously we just found like the same language really quickly and like I said in the beginning like the dynamic between us was very much um, feeding off of each other uh -huh. and also like there was this from the very beginning this mutual respect and appreciation for each other's craft and, and him as a coach and me as an athlete and we just kind of yeah, we could make this work really well for us. And that's how we just really like every day was an opportunity to get better and 
that's uh, more or less what we did. There is no special recipe or anything. It was uh-huh. me having done quite a bit of training previously and obviously that starting to pay off. And then I guess his, again, maybe also his technical model really fitting in with my personal technical model yeah. and that just was a really good um yeah, dynamic we found. What what was Robin's technical model? Because he, he was a specialist in coaching sculling. He, he coached those young guys in the British quad to a, a gold medal in Rio in 2015. Um, and uh, he had an amazing feel for how uh, sculling boats moved well. Yeah. So, so what did you notice about that? about his sense of how the boat moved? I mean, for me, it was straight away quite clear that he didn't try to kind of change fundamental things in terms of every person has their own unique style of rowing. Mm -hmm. And he didn't try to change that. He just kind of tried to use what what, what each athlete got to make the best out of that because like for me um for example it was very tempting to always row a longer stroke than i needed and the perception would be a longer stroke would make me faster but actually he was just focus focusing on efficiency and efficiency looks Mm -hmm. different for different people and i think that was one of his skills to kind of look for efficiency and maybe not necessarily a hundred percent always go after what the textbook says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. And one of the things you said about Robin, which really struck me, was that he was very empathic and he he looked at the person in as a whole person. Um, I just wonder if you can give any examples of that. Yeah, I think he was interested in, like, how are you actually doing? For example, like, when when he asked you, like, how are you doing? It wasn't just like, is your body all right? But like, are you feeling okay? Things like this, like the question actually meant um, something more other than just, are you able to perform today? And that's something very subtle. Like it's not something that is like um, done often because again, like normally it would just be like, are you able to perform today? Yes or no. Mm -hmm. Whether you were feeling okay or not, it didn't really matter. So he was really able, or he was always interested in hearing, how are you actually feeling? And then I think um, he, again, like took the person as who they were, didn't try to change any of their characteristics and kind of really tried to maybe strengthen some of those personal traits traits Mm. every individual had and whether it was necessarily 100% always connected to being a better athlete didn't really matter it was just kind of giving the person something to kind of hold on to it and say okay I'm actually good at this and kind of feeding off and giving self-confidence to someone maybe not even necessarily in rowing so kind of yeah, giving yeah, giving this sense of again, like I'm more than just a number. Yeah, yeah. Janine, am I am I right in saying that you and Robin um, were partners as well? Yeah. Um, can I can I ask how how was it being coached by your partner, and how did that change things or not? Um, I think because we kept the private life and professional life really from each other as in like private, like we didn't speak about it and we didn't um, discuss it publicly or anything. Um, It made it possible and it made it work really well for us. And um, again, what I mentioned before, like the mutual respect and appreciation for each other as a person and for each other as, as a also in in the separate roles we had was the base of everything we did. Um, So it didn't matter whether we were in the roles of coach and athlete, Mm. we had this huge respect for each other. And also we had this respect as 
as a couple. So I think this was the base of, of how, how we were operating. And um, I realize now how kind of healthy everything was we had because I still feel like I'm, I'm myself. So I was able to be fully myself um, with Robin, which is, I think, one of the best things that can, can happen in a relationship. Mm. Um, I can't imagine uh, what it must have been like when you found out the awful news um, that Robin had passed away. It must have been um, so shocking and difficult to deal with. Yeah, actually, I was the one finding out. I was actually there when it happened. So, I was, Oh, you're kidding. I was living through it. So, But I have to say, I have to be really honest and say I, I'm actually quite grateful to have been there because we shared so much and our journey was together. So for me to be able to be there in, 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 in that event and every step that was left after for his body or him as, as uh, yeah, I don't know, as, as, as the human being, I yeah. was able to go with him and this meant so much to me. So. Oh wow! That was actually, um, yeah, I'm really grateful I was able to be to be there. Will I, I'm just wondering. Um, I, I don't know. Will there be any memorials to Robin or anything like that? There has been a memorial here in Switzerland, and quite quite a lot of his friends came actually over for it. It was in the beginning of January, and um, yeah, I was I was able to, or I was given the trust by Robin's family, which I'm also really really grateful to to organize and, and to make that um, happen here in Switzerland. And uh, I don't know whether it will be something in the UK um, at this moment, but it's, it's possible that there will also be something in the UK on yeah. a later date. Um, Janine, one of the people watching us is is Jess DiCarlo. Um, and she said a couple of things. Thanks, Jess. It's very nice that you're, you're contributing to to our chat and um, she was reminded about what Greg Serler said it was like working with Harry Mann who also coached on Lake Zarnan in Switzerland about the you know the empathic relationship between coach and athlete and the, and the holistic relationship um, so I, I think that's that that's very nice um, so maybe we can turn a little bit to um, you and and sculling and and how maybe you got into the sport to start off with yeah so i grew up um 20 minutes outside of zurich on really close to a beautiful very calm lake without any motorboats in it and without any ferries or anything so basically always flat yeah and um we spent a lot of time around or yeah, next to the lake, fishing, swimming, whatever, playing. And um, that's how we saw the rowers. And then when I was just before I turned 13 years old, my mom was kind of suggesting for me and my brother, who was actually spare in the London Olympics, uh... for, the lightweight, for the lightweight four, to try rowing. And yeah, that's it. Like the rest is history. How long did it take you before you realised that you had a particular talent or a particular skill or that you could be really good at this sport? <laughs> um, so I was quite, I would say, amongst the top five, top three of Switzerland quite quickly in like under 16 and under 18 as well. Yeah. And, um but I didn't, I never made it to the Junior World Championships. I was at the Coupe twice. Oh, okay. Um, I medaled in the Coupe in 20, in 2008 in the single. Yeah. And that's where I felt the first time I kind of felt like actually maybe I'm not too bad at this. Uh -huh. But I was 18, year, 18 years old at, at this time and kind of, really not sure where my path was going to go, whether it was with rowing, whether it was um, with my profession or education. And I was just kind of in a bit of a tricky place. And 
it was made clear to me also that just because of this medal, I still kind of was too short to be good in the single ever. And so I had kind of like a few years where I kept rowing, but didn't really know where I was going to go with it. And then I was at the World Championship, under, under 23 World Championship yeah. in 2011. And again, my brother raced there and ah. he raced in the light men's quad and they won a bronze medal. And I was there watching it and like the atmosphere on the grandstand was just so, um, it just captured electric. my whole, yeah, it was electric. So it captured my whole heart basically. And I was like, well, right, I want to do this as well. Oh, wow. And I had one year left in under 23s and not having raced in under 23s before and like kind of a little bit off of like the standard. I just was like, right, I've got one year, I have to make it. And I did. I raced under 23s in a double mm -hmm. in 2012. And then I, I knew that I had to decide what I wanted to do in terms of rowing and spoke to my coach at the time who was Peter Monsfeld yeah. who's now in Texas um, and he kind of said like it's not going to be easy but you can do it and I was like right I'm going to try and then from there I just really 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 followed like every step necessary to, to, to become a professional athlete and set myself up in the best way possible um, to kind of make it to the Olympics. And that's what I did. Yeah. One thing that you said, Janine, which um, I kind of wanted to ask you, um, I think I, I looked up your height, which was one meter 71. Um, and um, you, uh, you, you said that, um, maybe people from Swiss rowing um, were saying that you, you were too short to be a top athlete or top scholar. How did you deal with, with those comments? Um, I just had to try anyway, because I wanted to find out for myself. I was like, mm. I gave it a shot at trying to qualify for Rio and I hadn't ever really thought about anything else other than just make it to the Olympics. And again, like it wasn't like my childhood dream. It was not something that I uh, really? ever really had in my, in my mind. I was watching obviously London 2012 because my brother was despair. And that's kind of when I got even like I got this sense of like what it actually means and what it is. And that's only when I decided, right, I'm going to give it a shot. And um, I never, I mean, I never even thought once about, I could also pursue like becoming a world champion or anything like this. I was just really determined to make it to the Olympics in 2016. And I didn't, I just had to find out for myself, like, can I do this? Am I able to do this? And at the same time, I, it was just also really clear to me that I just had to work so bloody hard for it. Yeah, and that's what yeah. I did. I just did not shy away from really working so hard and commit to what I needed to do to become better and fitter. And yeah, so I just fed off this kind of personal question of like can I actually do this because I wanted to know and whether I make it or not was kind of secondary because if I didn't make it it was like okay I I wasn't able to do this I'm yeah but I tried and if I make it like even better then I'm gonna be over the moon can you give any advice to you know maybe young athletes who who aren't the tallest um about what it what you know how they should think about their sport and and how they should achieve what their potential is i guess one thing is really kind of not shy away or maybe 
just not let other people tell you what you can or what you can't, cannot do. And then I think for me, the key factor was really um, just working on setting my life up in order to be able to actually do the work required. And I think that's always been really clear to me. Like I cannot um, bring 80% of my capacity. Like I have to go all in with yeah. everything. And that's that's the approach I've I've taken and I've taken that until today. Like I'm always committed to doing my best. And maybe like like I said before, I wasn't this competitive person. I'm not I'm still not the most competitive person, but why what I am is the most um committed to being my best, my own best. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm just really consistent and consequent also, like just committed to being my best. And that sometimes means going or taking the decision to go the harder way. Yeah. Um, it, it's really interesting because I, I, I kind of was looking at your results and so on. And I saw in 2014, you, you made the C final. Um, I'm, I'm guessing if you were taking a long-term view towards Rio, um, maybe that wasn't so bad. Yeah. Um, I guess it was, a, it was kind of still quite far off from a qualifying space. But it felt realistic to me to potentially be within reach of one of the last two spots, maybe, mm. um, to qualify the year the year after. Yeah. So that's kind of why I kept going. What What happened? Because I you you got this silver medal in the Europeans behind Nat Kova in 2015. I mean, that's a, a really big step up i mean what went on between 2014 and 2015 yeah um so i was working part-time in from 2012 to 2014 and in autumn 2014 i went into the swiss army which meant basically from october until march I was able to be a full-time athlete and uh, only focused okay. on training and recovery. And that's that's allowed me to progress physically um, very, very much. Oh, that's really interesting. So and and so you you say that that was directly um, related to your results in 2015, because you were um you you made the A final at the Worlds, which must have felt fantastic. I mean, that that must have been nearly fulfilling your dream, an Olympic qualification place and the A final as well. Yeah, again, like I said, uh, I kind of after 2014, I believed that there was the potential for me to maybe grab one of the last two places as in maybe eighth or ninth yeah. which would have qualified me for the Olympics but yeah making the A final I had this down as maybe after Rio something after Rio uh -huh. but yeah it happened a lot quicker and sooner than I anticipated and I was able to surprise myself there yeah what, what do you remember about going to that your first Olympics in Rio? Um, obviously, it's the first Olympics. They are very, very special. <laughs> I think you can't really replicate that feeling. Um, but I do remember just being so grateful to be able to be there and being aware of the privilege that I was able to live my dream. And um, what I... What's, duck out most or what I still remember to this day was um, luckily we were able to attend the closing ceremony uh, and being in the stadium with like thousands and thousands of other athletes 
having gone through a very similar experience and then obviously spectators in the stadium and then spectators at home on the TV, it gave me this kind of huge sense of um, collectiveness and uh, also being united Mm -hmm. with like such a big group of people uh, all for the love of the Olympics. And that's, that's something I remember from these Olympic Games very vividly to this day. Um, and your performance there was, was top quality, I'm guessing, that fifth place. Yeah, I mean, again, I've not, I've not like, I, not, not in my wildest dreams, I thought I'm going to make the A final in my first Olympic Games. And then again, I was able to surprise myself there. And um, to know what it meant or what this fifth place meant, I probably only realized after, as in years after, when, um, yeah, there I was just, it was just like, felt like kind of unreal and surreal. And, and I didn't really know what it, what it took maybe to really mm. achieve a result like this. And I only realized this when I, race like year after year on this level yeah yeah um so the the year after the olympics was a sensational season for you i think you were unbeaten in in world cups and, and world championships um did you wonder what was going on were you surprised at all by just how fast you were yeah, I did. I did surprise myself again, uh, especially first World Cup. I was racing with a broken rib, which I found out, out oh, only wow. afterwards. And then I had to miss Europeans that year because of that rib injury. And then came back winning the World Cup, the home World Cup on the Rotse, which was obviously really, really special. And then carrying on and becoming world champion, it was just kind of, yeah, again, uh, unreal, surreal. And um, I had not anticipated any of this, really. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to remember your, your race. You were so strong through the middle, particularly the third quarter. Was that a particular area that you focused on that year or, or was it were you just fast everywhere? Mm, I think the training plan was kind of based around volume. Yeah. And that's what really suited me, and that's why, why uh, I think, um, yeah, why I probably was just really well rounded in in all of the five hundreds of the race, really. Yeah, um, Janine, then Jess De Carlo, who's been watching, she she's got a question. I, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that twenty seventeen, but. Um, She's asked if you mind talking a bit more about your technique. Um, you mentioned working on effective length rather than max length. Uh, we we kind of covered that a bit. Is it? But is there anything more you could say on that? Well, just in general, like I try to focus on on being the most efficient and effective I could be, and my personal maybe favorite part of the rowing stroke is the catch. Oh, really? It's something I've been kind of working on, even though it was one of my strengths, I guess. Um, But yeah, I just think there you can kind of gain so much without actually um, needing any of your physical physical qualities to be outstanding. It's just really a technical aspect where I think you can gain or lose a lot. And so, yeah. Because it's my favorite part of the rowing stroke, I obviously try to make it better and better and better. But at the same time, Robin always encouraged me to also not forget about the areas uh, where maybe not so, um, not as good, strong, which was yeah. for me kind of maybe the, the release of the rowing stroke. That's where I had the most potential to to be better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, you also uh, talked about winning on the Rotse in um, in 2017. I'm, I'm guessing that was your first um, win on the Rotse. I just wondered what it's like for a Swiss 
person to win at Lucerne? If you could yeah, describe I mean, that, why is it? Uh, I mean, maybe it's an obvious question why it's so special, but you know, the thing with the cowbells and everything that goes with it. Yeah, I think the Rotze is special because obviously um, of the surroundings, like that's that's kind of the obvious reason. But also I think the the spectators are kind of the whole the whole race. They can be quite close to, to the racing mm. and to the athletes. And that that's something that's quite unique. Um I don't think there's um too many courses where you yeah. can you can be so close also because the whole lake is is really narrow. Um and then obviously like you can just hear the spectators um basically from start to finish and people shouting your name. And yeah, I think that makes it really special. Oh, wow. It, it, it must be amazing. Uh, and um, what was the, the feeling like in, um, in Sarasota to stand on the, the platform and, and get your gold medal? <laughs> I don't remember too much about <laughs> Sarasota, to be honest. A, maybe because it's kind of like already so in the past and I try to kind of not I don't know I just yeah try to not focus too much on, on like what I've achieved but kind of looking where I want to go yeah yeah uh, yeah so one reason also for me to not remember much about Sarasota I think is due to the fact that I was really able to be in the moment and especially in the racing I was able, I, I was really able to be in this so-called flow, which for me um, uh, was a really good sign that I was just really focusing on the present moment and yeah. doing my doing my best every single stroke. And I had my best races when I was in the flow, obviously. And that also meant after the race, I basically didn't remember anything of the race. Oh, wow. That's so interesting. That's so interesting. And was, was how many other occasions did you have that flow state journey i think i might have had it before sarasota but i think um during that season i had it main but main maybe for a part of the re, uh, part mm. of the races not the full through that 2000 meter and probably i had it also um in the years before already a bit but wasn't as much aware of of the fact as i was yeah. in 2017 and after, I definitely had it in, in quite a few races, but one of the other occasions I had it was during Tokyo. There I had races where I was fully in the flow and I could um, perform to my maximum capacity. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. So we, we'll talk about Tokyo in a little bit. I, I wondered um, one thing around you, you. You've come across lots of great competitors in, in the women's single skull. Yeah. Um, Kim Kim Brennan, uh, Sunita Paspura, Magdalena Lobnig, uh, Emma Twig, Vicky Thornley. What's your relationship with these athletes like, and uh, and what are they like as people? I think uh, they're all really, really gutsy, and they're all amazing people and amazing athletes, and um, very, very kind, all of them, and. I think um, racing something like head of the Charles in Boston or also the Basel head, you get to know the people a bit more behind the athletes because on the world stage, there is always this kind of pressure to perform and kind of stay mm. in your own lane and not really give away things. And in a different environment like head of the Charles, um, you have this fun element to it. And, and there I got to know all of them a bit better and, the mutual respect we have amongst the single scholars is, I would say, one of the biggest gifts I take away from, from being a professional rower. Oh, it's wow. really, truly special. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, one of those athletes, Sunita Paspura, um, she obviously had an amazing season in 2018. I, I still remember being surprised um, that you didn't win and how much um, Sunita won that final by what was that a silver medal won for you or a gold medal lost in in Plovdiv in 2018 it was definitely silver medal won um 
because that season started kind of being started off kind of tricky because the federation changed head coaches and with that some some of the training changed because of the training philosophy that was different with a different head coach so that was not ideal um but also for me like just because i've won gold medals before you never have this guarantee that you're going to win gold medal again so each race you have to really work hard and earn your medal or your rank or whatever um but yeah it was definitely a silver medal or one yeah 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 um that that's really interesting um and, and i know um how much trouble did that cause for you and robin uh the change in um chief coach It wasn't necessarily only the change that was kind of starting to be tricky. It was also for me um, having no no individual um, kind of ability or no ability to individually kind of tailor some of my training plan Mm -hmm. because obviously I was at the stage where I knew quite well what worked for me and what didn't. And that was one of the things that caused quite a bit of of um, disruption. Me asking for more individual um, kind of input into the training program. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So that that was quite of the kind of the tricky thing to to work around um, to not have this disability to have some input into my training. Yeah. So um, what was it that made uh, Tokyo? such a special Olympics because it was such a difficult, you know, where you found that flow state. It was such a a difficult Olympics on so many levels. Yeah, true. So um, for me, coming off of this 2018 season um, and the troubles and the difficulties and challenges I had to overcome in, in, in that season or also the season after actually in 2019, I ended up having a depression and um oh, really? so this was really really tricky to navigate and and i still to this day don't know how i actually made it to the a final with uh being in this kind of mental state but because of that i was really really kind of lucky that the olympic games got postponed because it gave me it gave me time to recover mentally it slowed things down and it just gave me the space I needed to kind of heal and more or less build myself up again. Yeah. And so being in the state, in the mental state I was in, in Tokyo was um, after those difficult years was really, really special. Wow. And um, I was really proud of how Robin and I got there. And then the games itself, um, I was so impressed and so humbled by the Japanese people and the way they were carrying themselves and the appreciation they showed and the host, uh, uh, how do you say, the hospitality. Hospitality, they, yeah. They showed towards us in the pre-camp and also during the games itself, like people were standing outside in the sunshine with like scorching heat. Mm. And when you were waving to them from the bus or giving them a smile, like it made their day. And it was kind of this honest um, humbleness that, that they had that humbled me so much that I was, yeah, just really enjoying these games so much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been really struck because depression is something that I've experienced on more than one occasion. Um, How you managed to compete at the same time. Yeah. I, to this day, I don't really know because there were moments I remember just kind of hoping that something was going to happen to me in order for everything to be over. But obviously Robin was really, really supportive. And I think, Mm. Um, was able to navigate through this with me really, really well. And, um, yeah, it's it's just another thing that I kind of take with me now also that he left me was just this this uh, amazing 
this this amazing teamwork we had going on where mm. he was just there supporting me and I was there supporting him when he needed it and and I think that's how yeah he he was operating and and obviously it helped me so much in, yeah. in like a difficult time like that yeah and at that time of COVID, um, it was interesting what you were saying about the space that it gave you, um, just just to be able to find yourself again. I, I just wonder, is there any any more you could say about about that process and how it worked for you? Yeah, obviously, um, when it all got postponed and COVID really kind of was at the height of the first wave, Robin and I were kind of stuck in Slovenia and that's a beautiful place. Yeah. A, and B, again, like there was not really anything we could do. Like at some point we weren't even really allowed to train on the lake. So all mm. we, all you were allowed to do was I think go out for a walk or maybe for a bike ride on your own or something like this. Luckily we had some equipment with us so I could do some sort of training, but it just really opened this space for me to just really slow down and really take the time to focus on very simple things like looking after myself or taking a moment to watch a flower grow oh, in the wow. garden. Because otherwise I would just not allow myself to do those things because my mind was completely occupied with how can I perform the best every day? And it, it allowed me to kind of move away from the, the performance thoughts and move towards how, what do I need in order to feel more like myself again? Yeah. And I, I'm, I, I just wonder if, if that experience that you had together with Robin, that that's helped you now in this you know, in this time of, of dealing with grief? For sure. Yes, for sure. I think everything that I've gone through and the skills I acquired going through those hardships, um, they do help me now, for sure. And the way I carry myself and everything, a lot of that I've learned over the years in being a professional athlete. And there are mechanisms that are really helpful in this difficult time that I'm going through now. Mm -hmm. That is for sure. But yeah, so many of the memories and so much that I've experienced with Robin, I that lives on in me and, and it gives me strength now. So that is the combination of those two, I think, is what makes me being able to, to say like I'm okay now and and even though this is the really difficult time, I know I'm I'm going to get through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You must have had so much support from the rowing community. I'm guessing in terms of messages oh. or 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 help. I mean, what's been the reaction of of from you know your friends in rowing? Yeah, like you say, the the, the messages of support and and understanding and everything was uh, amazing and overwhelming and. Um, some of my single scholar, sculling friends, they actually kind of offered me to join the, like Magdalena offered me to join their training group, for example, which I've uh, not really expected and which was something I seriously considered when I was unsure where my path was going to go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, the support and love has been from another planet really, really great. Wow. That's amazing. I kind of just want to uh, change change the angle of questions a little bit, um, just to talk about you know your training and the the type of training that you, you used to do. Um, I wonder, do you remember what a session that you really liked? You know, your favourite session, and perhaps the session that you least liked. I did like everything involving 2Ks, like repetitive 2Ks, like at different rates and things like this, because I just, yeah, I think the 2K um, race or the 2K distance is something really special. And 
the sessions for me the hardest were anything to do with sprinting because it just pushed myself out of my comfort zone so much. Uh, it was something that I didn't particularly enjoy. Um, so yeah, it was that was difficult for, for me because I had to push myself outside of my comfort zone. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and what about you on the uh, on the ergometer? Um, how were you using that machine? I always saw it as a really great tool to work on the physical fitness. And um, that's kind of the mindset I had being on the yeah. earth. It was reliable. Like you could count on it to bring you the fitness you needed. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it was just a, an essential tool basically. Yeah. So um, in the test that you did, what was your kind of 2K personal best? 6.47. Oh, wow. So that's pretty decent. <laughs> that's pretty decent. Not in the world of single sculling. <laughs> well, well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, Antuskos, um, who won in the Olympics, I mean, he was yeah. like a 5.59 or something, I, I think. I mean, and, and you doing that, that's possible. It, it's interesting to see what's what's possible, what you can do with with that kind of do you ever um no i, I, I was just gonna i was gonna ask in terms of um we've obviously seen something of your personality as, as we've been talking um but how would one of your friends describe your personality oh uh i'd hope they uh say that i'm empathic yeah um hard working i think would come up yeah yeah and also consistent and reliable, I think. Yeah. Are you more of an extrovert or an introvert type of um, character? Definitely introvert. Ah. And what's it? What What are some of the benefits in terms of being an introvert in rowing, um, or being an introvert as a single scholar? I guess I guess the two of those might go quite well together. Yeah, I guess I'm comfortable in my own company. I think that's probably a good thing or a good trait to have when you are in single. And I guess for me, it, I maybe because I'm the oldest of four siblings, I always had the sense of responsibility. Um, and yeah. <laughs> being responsible for my own actions and everything I do is something I, to this day, that's really important to me. And I think that's something really important if you're raised a single, like to actually take ownership of your actions and um, being able to face yourself in the mirror and yeah. be honest about your flaws and also your strength. Wow. That's beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering how, uh, I mean, this, it, it sounds like it might, it will evolve over time, but how, what sense you have of um, how your life will evolve uh, going forward now? Uh, you've mentioned already that, you know, you, you were out on the lake this afternoon and you've been um, getting the view from the coaching launch when you were in the UK. Yeah. Um, I definitely don't see myself as a rowing coach in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would like to stay involved in one way or another in rowing just to kind of give back because I feel like I had an amazing career and I was really fortunate to be living my dream like I said um, for quite some time and I would like to give some of my my experience back to like the younger generation mm -hmm. Um and then on like a personal level, I think there have been so many doors that, that, that have opened for me in the last few weeks. Really? And yeah, I'm actually a bit overwhelmed at the moment um, because I feel like I'm swimming in an ocean of possibilities, <laughs> which, is, which is obviously a huge privilege. Um, but I think my passion, and I know this 
since a few years already lies in supporting other people in becoming their best, whatever that means for them. Yeah. Uh, in which area that is, I don't really know at the moment yet. But I think it's probably where my journey is going to take me. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and it, will you watch international rowing this year? Um, the, the, the competitions? Um, is that something that you th you can see yourself doing? Or Yeah, definitely. Because I also have my two... Um, really good friends, uh, Patricia and Frederick, in the women's light work double that we'll yeah. be racing. So we'll definitely follow them closely. I will for sure follow the women's singles goal. <laughs> um, <laughs> even though there might be a bit of heartbreak, but yeah, I will definitely follow rowing um, this season for sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, and what else has Switzerland got in terms of hopes to to do well in the World Championships this year? What what crews are looking good for Switzerland? I mean, they have a really big group, or a really big group. I mean, for Switzerland, they've got a really good, big group of open weight um, women. Yeah, so that, I think that's really really great and. What boat class in, I have no idea what they've been training in. Obviously, they've had the quad last year. I'm quite certain that they probably will do the quad again, but there might also be one or possibly two other boats that they um, could be racing in, but I don't know any details about that. For that, I'm not involved enough. But, yeah, I think it's really exciting that Swiss rowing has such a big and strong and... Um, competitive group of open weight women. Yeah, that's amazing. And I, I just wonder, in terms of um, in terms of the Olympics, um, I guess every athlete has to go through a stage where you know that they've been an Olympian, they've they've been a competitor, and then th that first Olympics where uh, they're they're now watching from the outside. <laughs> uh, I'm guessing that's all part of a process anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got actually asked if, I, if I'm if i going to be a spectator in Paris a few days ago, and I don't know. Like, at this moment, I don't know. If I would have to decide today, I'd probably say more no than yes, because it would some be probably be something that would make me quite emotional and... It makes me emotional talking about it because obviously the decision to step away from the sport was not because I've had enough. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know yet. Yeah, yeah, that, that's really interesting. Um, Janine, I'm just wondering if there's anything that we haven't said um, about Robin that would be useful to talk about, any aspect of his character or any aspect of his coaching. I hope that I covered um, the essence of him. Um, but yeah, I'm just really grateful I got to work with him for so many years. And uh, for the experiences we were able to, to have together, because I will carry them forward. Yeah, amazing. Well, Janine, I think, you know, we've been talking for over an hour. Um, you've shared so much of yourself and, and your feelings. Um, which have been extremely raw um, on some occasions that um, I felt very humbled to be able to, to talk to you and listen. Thank you very much for having me again. Yeah, it was a pleasure talking to you. Um, so we'll end the live part of this interview now. Thanks, everybody. And, and thank you, Janine. Bye Thanks. for now.